Hello, everybody, and welcome back. So a few people have said to me, like, Mark, you jump all over the place with your topics. Like, what's this podcast about? There is a unifying principle. I am constantly talking about cult tactics, coercion, and I see these things, these tactics that occur in cults, I see them everywhere. And I see them, you know, I see them in romantic relationships, I see them in businesses, I see them, you know, in yoga studios, I see them, you know, in, in the medical field, I see them in corporations, I see them in governments. And in this current time, where literally, there's a lot of emperors who have absolutely no clothing on at all. And millions of people are ooing and eyeing. I see it very profoundly. I think that was one of the advantages of everything I went through is I could then look at the template that I was learning and start to see it in operation in many, many other contexts. So that's generally the unifying principle of what I'm looking at. Um, when it comes to narcissistic abuse, which is you know, one of my passions to talk about, and cult abuse, they, there's a lot to learn from each other. I think that people in the, the, the field of narcissistic abuse and narcissism who study those disorders have a lot to learn from the field of cult psychology. And given that, Richard Grannon and I created a course called Decoding Cults and Narcissists. And basically what we're trying to do is help you map these patterns out. So Richard from the perspective of psychology and me from my cult experiences. And whatever situation you've been in, we help you figure out, well, what the hell happened? how to heal from the damage and how to spot and avoid these situations in the future. Because it's my belief that until we learn the pattern, we have a tendency to repeat the cycle. So if you're interested in that course, I'll put the info in the show notes below. As always, wherever you listen to this podcast or watch this podcast, please subscribe and like. And of course, I'm not averse to a five-star rating, FYI. This podcast, as with all of them, is brought to you by my Patreon members who make all of this possible. If you'd like to support this podcast, please go to patreon.com forward slash Mark Vicente. So my guest this week is a dear friend of mine. I'm going to read you a quick thing about her and then we're going to jump into the discussion. Africa Brook is a Zimbabwean-born, internationally acclaimed consultant, accredited coach, speaker, and podcaster. As the founder and CEO of Africa Brook International, she's renowned for her expertise and nuanced insights into overcoming self-sabotage and self-censorship. In this area, she offers specialized consulting and high-level coaching services, along with ongoing support to public figures, teams, and individuals worldwide. Hosting two weekly personal development and philosophy podcasts, Beyond the Self and Unthinkable Thoughts, Africa's voice has resonated across various media platforms. She has been a sought-after guest on numerous television shows, podcasts, and radio broadcasts. Her contributions to mainstream publications, including The Guardian, showcase her thought leadership and her impactful keynotes have graced the halls of prestigious institutions, including Cambridge University. Africa is based in London. So here is my dear friend, Africa Brooke. So the, the first thing I want to say is that Bonnie sends you squeezes. She didn't want to say hugs. She wanted to say squeezes. <laughs> and I want to tell my audience um, how we met because, because they don't know. So I, I think this was maybe a year ago or longer. Uh, Bonnie and I were in Lisbon and she texted me out of the blue and said, uh, I think Africa Brooks in town. I just saw Africa Brook. I'm like, no, you didn't. Now, just to, to go back and give some context, I had first seen you, I'd heard of you, but I'd first seen you on, it was either Trigonometry or Michaela Peterson's podcast. And on Michaela Peterson's podcast, it was so interesting because Jordan Peterson jumped on, you, I believe, were taken by surprise. And I found your, um, I found your heart so open and so vulnerable about where your mindset had been and where you were now. And it was a very, very emotional episode for me to watch and I thought oh my god this woman is a warrior and then what made it even more extraordinary is then when I found out you were from Zimbabwe which just blew my mind because I grew up right next door in fact I remember when I was in boarding school 
in the um, the late seventies. I was I was way up sort of, you know, um, northern Transvaal, um, what was then northern Transvaal, and and everybody would talk about Rhodesia at first, and then later they'd talk about Zim. But I knew there was a war going on. But that's kind of all I knew as a, as a child. And then later, of course, I was required to be conscripted to go fight in the war, and I told them "f you." I'm very careful not to use the real word in the first seven minutes on YouTube because then I get penalized. But you know what I mean. Um, so that's how I that's how I found out about you. So then, okay, so Bonnie texts me, and so we start doing this. We start stalking you on Instagram, and we discover that you you were indeed up in up in Principe Real. And you just apparently had what I think you called one of the best massages of your life. And I thought, oh, my God, she's <laughs> here. It was like, like a rock star was in town. Um, and so I reached out. I don't remember what I said. I think I was just blabbering with, with words. I basically wanted to meet you so desperately. Um, and we had the most magnificent lunch. And then we stayed in touch. And then the end of last year, we had a beautiful dinner in a lovely little place owned by a friend of mine. That, you remember that beautiful little park? I think oh, it's called Brash des Forges. Oh, so Forge. beautiful. So beautiful. Um, so I think the world of you, and I just, I've been so excited to, to talk to you. We've been meaning to do this, but, you know, you've been yes. writing a book, et cetera, et cetera, which is, a, by the way, so, and I, I mentioned this, I, I read your book. It's extraordinary. I have not done the exercises yet. I'm going to let you speak soon, by the way. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to ramble forever. Um, it's an extraordinary book, and I'm so excited to talk about it. But um, what I'd love to do is, for my audience, have you share a little bit about you, your, your sort of early life, because I feel very strongly, and I want to get into this, your early life plays an enormous role in who you've become. Hmm. You know, to me, you're this, this outspoken warrior you have a clarity that is so refreshing. And, and by the way, sometimes when I don't feel clear, I listen to your podcast. It's not only for what you're saying, but how you're saying it. There's a clarity that is so extraordinary and it gives me clarity and gives me insight into whatever fears might be going on for me that are preventing me from expressing myself in, in, in a certain way. And also your vulnerability is so powerful. I'll stop saying amazing things about you now. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you ever do that? Why would I stop? <laughs> well, I need to let you talk at some point. <laughs> no, no. Oh, Mark, I'm so, 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 so grateful for you and for your friendship and for your wisdom and Bonnie and um, the way that we have been able to connect in this way. I was saying before we started recording that it's the odds of it happening are so slim that it's not something that I take for granted at all. So before I share and give the context of my own life, I, I just want to express that gratitude out loud because the person that you are and what you're putting out into the world is so important. My goodness, I I don't think I quite have the words for it. But this is where I feel like um, the English language especially sort of cheapens what I'm truly trying to put forward, you know. Um, but the fact that we're sitting here today, and I think it's happened at exactly the right time. I think had we had a conversation, let's say a year ago or a year and a half ago, there were so many things that we'll go into that I wasn't fully grounded in as yet, that I didn't fully understand in an embodied way i might have understood them in an intellectualized way but right now as i sit with you today i feel so i feel so grounded in who i am i feel so grounded in my voice and what my mission is and what is true and what is not and i love actually that we've been able to cultivate this friendship in a very slow and intentional way and nothing has been forced it's happened exactly when it's needed to um, so I'm so. very grateful that you would have me to have this conversation with you because it is time. It definitely feels like it's time mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Yeah. And another thing that I was saying that I'll throw in, uh, because it is part of the context of my life, 
when I was growing up in Zimbabwe, particularly when I was in Gweru, which is the countryside. So I was born and raised in Harare, which is the capital city where my father's family was from. Um, where my father's family ended up moving from Chuesha, which is our ancestral land. And my mother's family is from Gweru. And we would, almost every single day after finishing working in the farm, because all of us would be in my grandma's farm, even from when I was about five or six, you'd be in the farm. And then around 6, 7 p.m., we go in, my aunts start cooking, and then we would put on Sarafina which is the mm. film that you shot and I'm, I'm getting full body chills because how how I mean the way life works mm. every single day we would watch this film and it just brought so much joy to all of us we would sing all of the songs my sisters and cousins knew all of the dances and it came mm. out in 92 the year that I was born um, mm. and it, I, I mean just the man and now you and i get to sit together i get to call you a friend i get to call mm. you a colleague i get to mm. think of you as someone that i sit with and share food and wisdom with you know that that to me is it's, just it's extraordinary ah. i i you know making that film was one of the the great moments in my life it was the culmination because mm. because I'd been, it was a group of us making all these anti-apartheid films. I'll say it like the Afrikaners, apartheid, wow. anti-apartheid <laughs> films, you know. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they were all banned, you know. We were constantly getting in trouble. Um, and Sarafina was, was, we were started making it. Um, I think Nelson Mandela was just being released uh, from prison. Mm. And so we were starting to make it during that time and things were starting to shift. So it was the sort of culmination of all of our spirits of a story we wanted to tell. And, and by the way, uh, uh, Mandela came to visit us on set, which was absolutely oh, wow. extraordinary. It was just, we were just, I mean, tears, you know, we were just blown away. It was the most extraordinary thing. Um, but yeah, it was very meaningful. We began, uh, we began the film in, in, in I think November, 1990 we shot through into 1991 and then we released it in 92 and by the way i the a side thing but i think the film would have been much bigger but what happened is as it was being released in america the rodney king riots happened and right. everybody's focus went to that and as, as it should have gone but mm -hmm, the film didn't mm -hmm. land in america the way it landed for instance in africa you know, which oh, was very wow. moving to many, many people. Yeah. And in the UK, did it have much impact in the UK at the time? I think it did. I think it did. But I think America at that time was so focused on what happened with Rodney King. But, you know, I'm yes. still, I, I watched it recently because it was just our 30 year anniversary and I watched it recently. And of course, you know, there's the, the, the feeling of like, I remember every single shot and everything we did. And but yeah. there's also the experience of just of just watching it and, and working with those kids, those singers and those dancers working with mm -hmm. them. What an experience, you know, what mm. their 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 energy. And by the way, I wanted to tell you this. Gosh. Whenever I hear you laugh, I feel like I'm at home. Mm. The way you laugh is the way people laugh in Africa. Yeah. You know? Does that make sense? Mm, oh, uh, oh, absolutely. It makes sense. I feel like um, when I'm around my family and even a lot of my friends who majority are African too, um, I really see it that we, we laugh as Africans and it doesn't matter the color of your skin. If you are no. African, the way we, we laugh with our full bodies. I'm even holding yes. it back because I'd be slapping the table. <laughs> I'd be slapping your knee. <laughs> So I'm even, uh, I'm, I'm being quite modest right now. Um, yeah, of course. <laughs> but it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And so, so that part of my story, I just had to put it forward because I, oh my goodness. So I was, I was born and raised in Zimbabwe, in Harare. And by the time that I was born, I'm the third child. I have two older sisters and one younger brother. And my dad, he was a brilliant, brilliant man. He was a teacher. His name was Maxwell. He was very reserved, 
but very, very charming. If he walked into a room, you could feel his energy. He always dressed really smart in his suit and his mini afro, which was, there was never a hair out of place. And he was always well moisturized, had a beautiful smile. (laughs) That was, (laughs) that was Maxwell. He was, he was incredible. He really, really was. And my mother, Jennifer, who's still alive today, she is a brilliant, brilliant woman. I mean, most people, of course, you expect them to say these things about their parents. But as I get older, I really get to see and appreciate my mother's brilliance. She was also very reserved, just very quiet, conservative, but much more liberal than I could have given her credit for. And I'm sure we'll speak about that at different points. Um, And together, I get to see the beauty of them more so in photos now because by the time that I was getting much older, by the time that I was six or seven, eight, my dad's relationship with alcohol had taken a very, very dark turn, a very, very dark turn. So to begin with, when I was much younger, and this is all from collecting stories from the people, you know, that grew up with him, his siblings, my mum, he just started drinking as, you know, like a social thing, but that, that's, that's what men do in Zimbabwe. After work, at around the same time, everyone meets at the civic center and you sit and you, you know, and you have, and you have beers and you have, what were the, the names? There was, you have Chibuku, you have whatever else, but you sit and you drink and you tell stories and then you go home and you eat whatever your wife has cooked. It's like a ritual, you know, but what is never addressed is the level of alcoholism and addiction and the violence that comes with all of that. And at the time, especially in the 90s, it it's kind of, it was sort of seen as just part and parcel of it, that sometimes your husband might get drunk and just knock you around a little bit. And that's how it started with my mum and dad. Um, and when I speak to her now, she, she always... Um, tells me that it wasn't always like that. He was never just this abusive man, you know, he, he wasn't like that at all. But when Zimbabwe started to go through a very rapid economic decline and he lost his job, but my mom still had her job. She was a geologist at the time. And he felt a lot of shame around the fact that she was still working and she became the breadwinner and he'd lost his job. So my dad was a teacher. He was a teacher from when he was 19 up until he died. And he started to feel a lot of embarrassment. I'm sure there's a lot more to the story, but this is the story that I have to work with. He started to feel a lot of shame around the the way the power dynamics had shifted. And around this time, My mum had also found religion, but it was a very interesting uh, aspect of religion. We'd been raised Christian, but never really in any sort of uh, strict, rigid, every single Sunday you have to dress this way, we can't watch TV. It was never really like that. Christianity was just a part of the culture, really. Um, But my mum found this church called End Time Message, which... um, is the church founded, I believe, by a brother Branham. Have you ever heard of, of not, his no. name? Mm-hmm. No. He kind of brought this, um, I don't know what language you would use, but he brought a specific version of Christianity, if you will, to Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. And it was called mm-hmm. the End Time Message. And you can tell by the name that it's sort of like a mm-hmm. doomsday. It has a doomsday element to it. But when yeah. we were young, we didn't know. Just Sunday, oh, right. we're going to End Time Message. You know, we, <laughs> we had no idea. <laughs> no idea. So then slowly my mum started to, and again, my mum was a very conservative in different ways, but also very liberal woman. When Bob Marley and other musicians would come to Zimbabwe, they would go to concerts. My mom never ever drunk, but she would be the one to sneak Mm. in the beer for everyone, for my dad and and my aunts. Mm. But she Mm. she was a very open woman. But by the time she found this church, everything completely changed in our household. She stopped listening to music. We couldn't listen to music. 
um, TV that had to go completely. She cut up all of her trousers. She wasn't allowed to wear trousers anymore. She only wore long skirts. But what I really love and appreciate about my mum is that she never forced that onto any of us. But it's her mm. home, so there are certain things that will have to change. But she never forced any of that so strongly onto us. Mm. Um, but my dad definitely felt the shift because the Jennifer that he knew was a very different woman. Sure, she was reserved, but not to that extent of cutting up all of her clothes, uh, removing certain things from the house, no more music, etc. So all of those things combined, the economic decline and the shame that he felt, and then, you know, all of these sort of rules and this church that we all have to start going to now. Um, he felt like he was being controlled. And these are such new stories that I now have from the past couple of years, few years in writing this book and kind of wanting to understand where, where I first learned to self-censor parts of myself. I realized that it's because my mum learned to self-censor parts of herself too. Yes. So my father started to feel out of control. So the abuse got really, really bad, the physical abuse and his addiction got much, much worse. It started off as him being physically abusive to her, and then eventually it was all of us. So we never knew, in our house, we never knew what version of my father we were going to get. Sometimes you would get, again, the Maxwell that I first described, just incredible and charming and wanting us to draw, wanting to see our art, um, being curious about us and, mm -hmm another day or even in the same day maybe from morning to afternoon to evening you get a different version a different version yeah. of him the version that is screaming and shouting and wanting to know who has drawn all of these things on his work papers the work papers yes. that he would have given us the day before so we can draw on them no draw on this i want to see you but then yeah. he would completely forget you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so the 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 memories that I have of my childhood in Zimbabwe, because we were back and forth from Harare to Gweru. Um, mm. And sometimes I, I now know that when things got really, really bad or my mom was so beaten up that she had to, she couldn't, we couldn't see her. Then we would go to my grandma's or we'd go to my aunt's or, but to us, we're just going to visit our cousins because we have a very big mm. family. So we'd be all excited. We're just going to be with our cousins for a week or whatever. But it's mm. so that my mum could actually recover so that we didn't have to mm. see her with black eyes or her being beaten, you know. I mean, I'm just thinking that, and, and I'm sure you've mm -hmm. explored this a great deal, but like, so for you as a kid, that means you're, you're having to carefully map out how to behave very oh. carefully. Mm -hmm. Very. Right? To stay very, safe, very. to not get hit, to not get hurt. You have to know all the rules and the rules change all the time, Absolutely. as you said, because you don't know and what's coming next. That's exactly it, Mark. And that's why the parallels to some of the things we'll talk about later. It's just it's been so fascinating to sort of tie all of these things together. That thing mm -hmm. about the rules always changing. The goalpost mm -hmm. will move at any moment mm -hmm. and there will never be a warning. Mm -hmm. it, it would be easy to think that I was aware in some way that I was kind of um, adjusting my behavior, overly editing my speech, learning how to be a compulsive liar, because that was the only way to actually navigate the environment that I was in. You learn to lie and you learn to lie very, very well. And you mm. knew when you would need to lie about something, you know. Mm. Um, but it all happened so seamlessly and unconsciously. It wasn't just a thought, but that's what happens when you're in survival, right? You sort of just adjust mm -hmm. so quickly to the environment that it's you're not even doing it in a conscious way. It's not a decision. Yeah. It's just like a, a decision that is made internally for you. Um, yeah. So my childhood was, and I mean, those, those are the very dark parts. But again, the thing that I was saying before about wanting to make sure that when I talk about the past, I really think about it in a very holistic way, because mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that I had two, that I had three siblings. My, my younger brother was mm -hmm. born at that time and we could just play, we could just play mm -hmm. and escape in our own world. 
and mm-hmm. being born somewhere like Zimbabwe where you don't even have to be wealthy to have a yard to have la- to have mm-hmm. land you mm-hmm. know so mm-hmm. we just played outside all of the time mm-hmm. we had an orchard behind our house and we named it Pearline City so mm-hmm. when my mum and dad would argue we would just go my older sister would just get us into a wheelbarrow and she'll say I'm going to drive you to Pearline City and we'd all just go and just play for hours. And it's Mm. so I had an incredible childhood, too, because of my environment, because we could get out and play and climb trees and go next door. And so there really was that darkness within the home. But outside the home, there was so much to explore and so much to see. And I'm thankful for that specific timeline of the 90s where you had to be so creative in how you Mm -hmm. experience joy and pleasure you know um so that that was my childhood that duality and i always say that it's there especially with my father and i realize it now and i'm so grateful for maxwell i'm so grateful for my dad because i really learned to hold multiple truths about a person right that's that's i really did Yes, and that's something very powerful in in what you talk about because you're not about the extremes. You're about mm-hmm. there's 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 so many shades of gray in between, Gosh. and I think you said it, if not in your book, in in a in an interview you did, being able to hold these multiple truths simultaneously mm. of your father, for instance. Yes, I think yes. is so powerful. So I want to. I want to sort of go from, and there's a lot more, and, and I want my, my audience to know that there are extraordinary interviews that Africa has done, uh, one with Diary of a CEO that I think is mm. very, very good. And, and yes. you go into great depth about a lot more. But I really want to move into your book. Um, I'm going to just jump a little bit uh, in your life because I am so, I'm so interested in how, you know, people's journey from, from you know, what I, what I term rock bottom which is a very profound place to get to Mm. because there's a stripping that occurs. And then you find this extraordinary um, clarity. Mm. And you have spoken at times about, you know, having an alcohol problem and, you know, you know, different, different addictions and things. But there was the shift that occurred that I'm really interested in, you know, given this difficult upbringing in your childhood that was infused with things about alcohol and certain negativities. And then you made this decision, I suppose, the word I would use to clean your life up. Yes. And I'm so interested in, in what was the thing that shifted in you that allowed you to make that change? Hmm. So when I had, we eventually moved out of Zimbabwe, me and my family, when I was nine years old. And it was me, my mother, my siblings, so the four of us, and my father was supposed to eventually follow so this was in 2001 and actually my my mother had arrived in 99 so she could set everything up and by this time all of her qualifications and everything she had done as a geologist back in zimbabwe meant absolutely nothing Mm. in the uk Mm. and when i say nothing i mean absolutely nothing and we were not from a wealthy family with connections or anything like that she had grown up in absolute poverty with 10 siblings and had managed to go to university as as a young woman and had met people through university that had allowed her to get an internship in in rhodesia and zimbabwe at the time where mining was a very very big part of zimbabwe at that time but again by the late 90s with the economic decline and her having to leave the country in order to find something, anything. All of that meant nothing in the UK, unless you're well connected and can maybe move into oil or something, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. So my mother um, went into nursing, which for immigrants, especially um, women coming from Africa or the Caribbean, it's the easiest way to get a job and to eventually get a permit to stay. And that's what my mother did. And she had to be a student again in her thirties and stay in student halls. And that's, that's where we were going to be staying with her when we arrived. And my father was eventually supposed to follow on, but he ended up passing away due to alcohol in 2004. And 
by that time I was pretty much assimilated and had become kind of like a British girl because when you're nine, yes, I'm old enough to remember exactly what life was like back home, but I'm also young enough to adapt to my new environment so quickly, so, so quickly, and sort of feel a level of freedom that I never felt. And this is why I'm, I'm so, um, I'm so serious about the idea of freedom, giving yourself freedom and reminding yourself that you are free because I didn't realize how unfree we were as a family and how unfree my mother was until we came here. And I saw my mother gaining weight again. She had lost so much weight from the abuse and stress and everything else. But back home, I couldn't see it. We couldn't see the difference. Um, so I, I, I always think around that time is when I, I really started to see what freedom looks like, even freedom of movement, that, oh my goodness, we can go 20 minutes down the road without having to bribe a police officer. Yes. Wow. There's something called a job center where people will help you find a job and yes. pay you 70 pounds a week while you're looking for a job that's unheard of you can mm. go to the hospital for free and they have equipment to treat you that's mm. Mm. insane um but mm. fast forward to when i was 14 so starting to experience life in the uk and then when i was 14 is when i discovered alcohol it's when i started drinking again if you're in the uk it's just seen as a rite of passage it's just something children do some people grow out of the phase, but it's a phase that most people will experience. However, for me, it was, it was, there was something quite different about it in that I blacked out the very first time that I drank. I blacked out and experienced again, a level of freedom within myself and my body and my mind that I'd never experienced before. I didn't have to think about my race because suddenly I was being made hyper aware of my race, especially because of where we lived when we moved uh, to the UK, which was in Kent, predominantly white. Um, so I was made very aware of my differences by other people, other children. And I'm so, I'm so grateful to be from a home where we were never made to feel like immigrants. My mum never spoke about us being immigrants or that we're black today, uh, so we can't do this, you're black, so you can't. There, there was nothing like that. My mum accepted the reality of what life is like now, but there was never any victimhood, N mm. not even once, not even once, not even when my mum experienced severe racial abuse. And I'm not talking possible microaggressions like mm -mm. actual racial abuse in the early 2000s where there's nothing like diversity there is no blm there is there is no one telling you this is a wrong way to speak no th this is just you know you just ignore people that you know yeah. say yeah. these things yeah. um but victimhood was never something that was um a part of the way that i grew up in any way apart from when other people highlighted my differences in the hope that I would feel victimized by it, but I never really did. But on some unconscious level, it did get to me because when I drank for that first time, I just felt so free. I didn't have to think about it. I could be confident. I could be whoever I wanted to be. I could, be, there was just a freedom or, or an idea of freedom that I was sold. But then that's when I started to replicate my father's pattern from the age of 14 to 24. It got, it got really bad. It started off as it always does as fun as a party. You know, you become the party girl. It becomes an identity, but I was replicating my father's pattern to a T. He also started in the same way just being the life of the party, being social, you know, you get to see a different side of Maxwell. It was the same mm -hmm. thing with me. Mm -hmm. um, but the blackouts got longer and longer as in the time frame that I would be in a blackout for. Sometimes it would be a couple of hours, sometimes three, sometimes four. And then routinely it would be up to eight hours where I have no idea what has happened. I have wow. absolutely no idea. And when someone is in a blackout, typically you can't even tell because it's not like I was slurring my words or I was, mm. you know, 
I'm just dead behind the eyes and because I'm drinking so fast, I can't make any long-term memories. So I can only make short-term memories. So only I'm only going to remember something that happened five minutes ago, maybe 10 minutes, maybe at a push 15. But apart from that, I, I have no idea what's, I'm, I'm not actually collecting anything in terms of long-term memory. Oh, I didn't understand that. That's mm-hmm. very interesting. Yeah. I just want to say one thing quickly, because you're, you're describing a level of dissociation that's so profound. Mm. And I really am understanding now the way you're, you're, you're describing it, that there was relief in oblivion. Yes. Oh. Oblivion was the better choice. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And now as a 31 year old woman who has had enough time to really look at all of these patterns, I get it. Mm. Chaos was all I knew. Mm. And there was always that feeling, even from when I was younger with my father and the environment that we grew up in, that if things were good, so my father's good, we're all good. It's not going to last for long. Mm. It's not going to last for long. Something is going to happen. Whether that something is something my mom says that's wrong or my dad decides something is wrong or one of us gets into trouble so we're all in trouble and then Mm. something is going to happen it's never going to last long Mm. so i was more comfortable in the chaos because it was i i knew i knew what form it's going to take we get beaten Mm. and then blah blah i i knew so in in those 10 years of my addiction 14 to 24 I tried to get sober so many times, especially from the age of 19, when it started to get really bad, really bad. There was kleptomania. There was um, a lot of just casual sex, so much promiscuity. There was um, just the compulsive lying had got to an extreme, such an extreme. Because again, there was always this thing that I had of, if I tell the truth, I'm going to be in trouble. And it could be the simplest thing. Oh, what did you eat today? I I would feel like I needed to lie because if I tell the truth, what if I ate the wrong thing? Oh, it's really profound. If I tell the truth, I'll be in trouble. Always. That that was always the thing. Always. And it it didn't, even with things that didn't make any rational sense, exactly like I said, someone saying, oh, so what did you do this morning? Oh, so what did you Mm. eat? Mm. There would just be this thing of, I don't trust you. If I tell the truth, I'm going to be in trouble. So I need to, I need to lie, you know? So the compulsive lying just got worse and worse and worse. And it would be amplified when I was drunk. Mm. And eventually you start to lose people. You yeah. just start to lose people. And it, it's, it happens very, very slowly. Maybe people only want to see you when it's a party situation, but through the lens of sobriety, they don't really know you at all, you know? And because I was so unreliable, I couldn't commit to anything, couldn't commit to anything. But that chaos was so exhilarating. It was almost arousing sometimes, mm-hmm. that level of just, chaos and destruction and knowing that I will have something that I need to fix and apologize for in the morning, but I don't actually know what it is. There's something quite mysterious and exciting about it. And that was for a decade. And Mm. I tried to get sober many times in that decade, but seven times specifically that I relapsed, which were very big relapses. But every time that I would stay sober for three months and I'm being reliable again. Everything feels good again. I'm keeping to my word. I'm turning up to work on time. I, my friendships, instead of drifting away, they're getting even closer. I have more intimacy. It would feel so uncomfortable. Yes. It would, it it would feel so uncomfortable. And then I would relapse. So I wasn't relapsing because I'm having withdrawals uh, from the Mm -hmm. actual alcohol itself. It was the complete inverse of that. Mm. Things are going way too well. The, mm. I, I don't know this. I don't know mm. this version of me. Um, mm. And it's all going to end one day anyway. So let me just get in there first, which mm. is where self-sabotage came in. Right. So is, mm. it like, is it like there's an itch for something yeah. else that, will, that is better? Somewhere, somewhere. It's like a, not even not even boredom necessarily, but I, I think a lot of it was a worthiness thing. Like mm. I don't I don't deserve for things to be so good. 
I don't like I don't actually deserve to be to be that person and there was an identity thing too to be that person that shows up to work on time to be that person that says mark if I'm I'm going to do this tomorrow at this time mm -hmm. and then show mm -hmm. up I was mm -hmm. the person who says mark I'm going to be there tomorrow we're going to have this interview and then at 9 50 I turn off my phone I just mm -hmm. it, I turn off my phone and then you won't mm. hear from me for three days. And then after three days, I'll say, oh, this this thing happened. So sorry, I could, that, that, that was me, you know? It's, it's so, you know, I, when my audience reads your book and please all of you mm. read the book, you will see that the, the, um, the person that wrote that book and the person that you're describing now, they're almost like, it's almost like a completely different identity. Oh gosh. It's so extraordinary the shift that you went through. Huge, huge. And it didn't mm. happen. I would say that shift started happening from the age of 19. Yes, I got sober mm. at 24, but 19 is when I woke the fuck up and I knew, I, I, I saw for the first time and because my mother told me, she was very anti-conflict too. But one day I took it so far that she had no choice but to tell me that I was repeating my father's pattern. She told me, cause she'd had to deal with it from the, interestingly enough, she met my dad when she was 19, he was 20. And I was 19 when we had this conversation and she was telling me, I have seen this before. It's the exact same thing. And I didn't, I, I understood it because I'm very different to all of my siblings. My siblings never had a phase of anything. They're, they're very good, very good, very disciplined. They don't drink, do anything. I was the fucking wild one. I wanted to be the Keith Richards of the fucking household, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but by the time, you know, it, it brings me back to the thing that you were saying, what was the catalyst, you know, for mm. this shift? Mm. It would be so easy if I could say that there was one big moment, you know, one big mm. grand finale where I woke. It, it wasn't like that, Mark. I, mm. I was just so, I was tired. I was tired mm. of saying the same shit over and over again, that I'm not going to do this anymore. I was tired. What was exhilarating at some point in time, that mystery of waking up and not knowing what happened, this kind of... I always call it like my personal game of CSI where I'm like, oh, what happened? Okay, let me look at the text. What did I say on Facebook and retrace my steps? Oh, I was at the Haggerston, I was in Dalston. And then I, it became the shame that started to come with it from 19 to 24. It was so rapid. I was just, mm. I was just tired of saying that I do all of these things. I've always been an artist and a writer and, I would just say that I'm going to do all of these and never do, never do any of it. Mm -hmm. And eventually mm -hmm. there were just two people left in my life. My ex, Billy, who's a wonderful, wonderful man. We still speak to this day. And my best friend, Roxanne. And they had to give me an ultimatum that if something doesn't change, because they had been with me for, for those seven relapses before where mm -hmm. I promised mm -hmm. that something is different, something is changing. Mm -hmm. um, they gave me an ultimatum and I'm so grateful for it because I didn't try again for the eighth time for myself. You know, that would be the beautiful answer to say one day I woke up and I just felt like Africa, you deserve better. That wasn't mm -hmm. it. I could have carried on. Mm -hmm. I could have actually carried on, mm -hmm. but I did it for them because I only mm. had two people left and yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't do it for myself, but it became for me maybe three months or four months into it. But I'm so, I'm so lucky that I've always loved to read. I've always loved to write. I've always been very, very curious. I was in a household that didn't allow for me to be curious, but outside of the house, I was always so, so curious. I had questions. I'd always love to read um and I'm from a culture too African culture Zimbabwean culture where books and reading and writing it's it's really really important yeah. and when I was 24 I I started to get again that curiosity I wanted to understand is this a moral failing on my part so the shame that I feel am I really just a is it true that I'm just that fucked up that I 
can't let any good into my life, that I can't have a conversation or have sex or feel intimacy. If I, if I haven't drunk something or snorted something or smoked something, is it really just a moral failing full stop or could it be something else? And then I, it's like a door was opened and so many answers just flooded through and that was psychology discovering psychology and specifically discovering the term self-sabotage so Mm -hmm. self-sabotage is when things are going very very well you're on the right path you're getting very close to your goal or whatever it is that you say you want to do and then for whatever reason the closer that you get you just start to feel sort of like um, the, the, there's some kind of discomfort that comes with it as you get closer. And sometimes it can be a worthiness thing. Do I really deserve this? Am I really ready for this? Actually, let me move on to this other thing. We'll, we'll leave that for a moment, move on to the other thing. But you somehow end up pulling the plug on yourself, yeah. Yeah. right? Or, yeah. uh, or a part of you thinks, well, the shoe is going to drop anyway. So Mm -hmm. let me just get in there first and just, you know, just Mm -hmm. wrangle everything up because it's going to happen anyway. And this Mm -hmm. is not a logical, conscious thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I realized that I was much more comfortable in the chaos to the point Mm -hmm. where everything was actually working out, it was Mm -hmm. I didn't have the capacity to hold it. I didn't have the capacity to hold joy, pleasure, follow through Mm -hmm. intimacy. I had the capacity to hold destruction and chaos and apologies and regrets. I had the capacity for that. So I would sabotage anything that didn't fit into what I thought I could hold, you know. This makes Uh, perfect sense to me, by the way, because somebody described it to me as things are going so well, but but you don't feel normal mm, and you're looking for normal mm, and normal is chaos. So it feels... And it's not even, they, they said to me, it's not even an intellectual thing. You don't intellectualize. Yeah, no. it, you're, you're just somatically, you feel like that's yes. more me. That's more life, the world, reality. I know that. I know this that. This is like this blank, empty fucking desert. Yes. Of unknown. Yes. That's, a, that's exactly it. And my world was expanded so much when I discovered that term and then just discovered so many other things that gave me language because finally mm-hmm. I had the language for my internal experience. Mm-hmm. And with that language, I could then figure out, is this working for me or against me? And then find mm-hmm. some kind of solutions to work with it. And that kept me sober. It really yeah. kept me sober. And yeah. I was sharing all of this out loud publicly. I had an anonymous Um, the Instagram that I have today, it was anonymous to begin with. Any time that I was, so even if you scroll right down, I don't have that many posts. You can see on day Mm -hmm. one, on the 7th of November, 2016, and I was 24. And I said out loud to no one in particular, because it was was never to build a platform. Are you Mm. kidding me? I didn't, what the fuck was a platform? What the (laughs) platform? I just, I, Mark, I just needed to get well. I just yeah. needed to get well. I had relapsed so many times before. Rehab is not a thing where I'm from. Mm. It, it's mm. not a thing. Rehab is for rich people, mm. you know. Um, even the language of rehab at that time was something that was so underground that it, it was mm-hmm. not even something that was in the public sphere in the way that it is mm-hmm. now. Um, going to AA, I went to a few meetings, but I didn't feel... I really didn't feel comfortable at all standing up each time and repeating the mantra, hi, my name is Africa and I'm an alcoholic and I'm powerless to alcohol. That that didn't feel true. No, no, it did no. not feel true. And I felt even if, if it was just a handful of times, I felt like I was etching that idea of powerlessness onto my identity and that did not feel true yes. whatsoever. Yes. Yes, I have, um, like you, I have deep concerns about developing your identity around that I have, that you have a disease forever and you're you're fucked forever. I, I have a huge issue with that. I'm sure that I'm going to get a lot of shit for saying that, but Hey, you know, here, here we are. Absolutely. Um, I want to, so, so a comment that I want to make is I want to lead to something to your letter you wrote, um, you know, thinking about the little bit that you've told us, and there's a lot more Mm. I know. Mm Mm-hmm. It would have been easy for you to build your new self sense of esteem 
on how fucked up everything had been for you and mm. how difficult everything had been for you. You could have built that identity of like, look how hard I've had it, look how awful it is, and you know, my race, where I'm from, there's all this stuff. Mm -hmm. you, you could have done that, but you made a really decisive decision. Uh, and, you, and you wrote this, um, this open letter, so that was 2021. Yes. You wrote the open letter, Why I'm Leaving the Cult of Wokeness. And I will, I will link the, the letter in the show notes below, but I'm really curious because that's another shift mm. that you, you, you went through. And I'm curious about what spurred that on. Yeah. Um, and what was the message you were trying to, to express? Yeah. I, you know, with the, the origins of that letter, even though it was published in 2021, I would say that it, it definitely began in so many ways from me sharing about my sobriety because exactly mm. as i said how i actually stayed sober was through sharing i had no intention of building any kind of platform especially at that time sobriety was not a marketable brandable sexy thing as it is now mm -hmm. like i said i just needed to get well and i knew that i needed to do it out loud otherwise keeping it in the privacy of my home I could relapse, I could start drinking again, no one would ever have to know. So there wasn't that element of accountability. So when I started sharing, my story got picked up by the UK media pretty quickly in 20, I would say by 27, late 2017, about a year, a year later, my story was picked up very quickly. So I went was into this, a, Was this anonymously or, or you were, your so name at that after point? after three months, I stopped being anonymous. Okay. Because okay. around that time, I started to experience kind of like a three month itch of being like, ah, I've, I've done enough time. Maybe I could have a little, you know, tipple. And I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew that it's because there was still that element of anonymity. So I revealed my identity, like a big reveal to not that many people. It wasn't that big it was to a small audience. Okay. But it was, it was a big enough reveal. And I right. shared the, um, I wrote another open letter actually at that time in 2017, which I'll share mm. with you. Mm. It is so profound to see the parallels from that open letter to the one that I would then write some years on. And I had completely mm. forgotten about it, but it was an open letter declaring that I am an addict. I am tired of hiding this. I've been hiding it for a very long time and I don't want to do that anymore. It is so mm. profound, the parallels, Mark. I'll send it to you right after this. Please, please, yeah. But I shared that in 2017. And I remember even some, some family members being proud of me, but they were also concerned that is this some form of kind of self-flagellation? Am I sort of punishing myself in some way? Am I sure that I want to be sharing this? Which is so interesting because the same thing would happen some years later, right? Are you sure you want to be saying this, Africa? We, we get it, we respect you, but are you sure? And it was not about me, it was about their own discomfort, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But my my story got picked up quite quickly by the UK media because of my age, because of my heritage. And I, I mean, it was an objectively compelling story. 25-year-old mm -hmm. girl who struggled with addiction for 10 years from Africa. Like the story was compelling, especially at that time. And I knew that. Um, but what happened from then is that my work started to be labeled activism. And this is a really important part of the story. I started to be labeled first as a sobriety advocate, which was completely fine. That's exactly what I was doing. I was advocating for sobriety and just more of an awareness of how the alcohol industry actually works, how they market alcohol towards women, etc. cetera, um, how you will find more liquor stores in areas that are lower income, um, th that kind of thing. So I was sharing mm. anything that I would discover, but it was for me to get well and to stay well but it was labeled as activism immediately. And I, I didn't really take much issue with that at the time. In fact, there was something that I really appreciated about it because it felt like what I'm putting out is being taken seriously, you know? So I was, I was completely fine with it. Right. However, as time moved on from 2017, and this is a crucial time because by this time, Donald Trump's name is in the public sphere in a different way. 
And for a lot of people, you might start to notice that around 2016, 2017, a lot of things just started to shift in terms of how we interact with each other as a society. Just the level of polarization and division spurred by the media, but also social media. So around this time, so my work is labeled as activism. So naturally I start to be um, connected with other activist groups. So whether it's gender activists or racial injustice activists or whatever it might be, intersectionality, all of these other things, which again, I understood, loosely understood, but appreciated the sense of community and that my work and what I'm doing is actually being taken seriously. And I'd actually started to study and learn about self-sabotage and different threads of psychology and union psychology, which is a lot about mm -hmm. shadow work. And, um, mm -hmm. oh gosh, I'd love to have a conversation with you around that. Um, but a lot of my work was really just I was focused on wanting to understand sabotaging behavior in all of its forms. Yeah. So yeah. I started to notice the very thing that I now call collective sabotage, which is referred mm -hmm. to as cancel culture. I started mm -hmm. to notice it around the, these times, being part of these activist spaces. But suddenly being part of these groups, I began to notice that my identity was being, um, I had to lead with my identity, particularly my racial identity, especially through mm -hmm. the lens of intersectionality, where you're supposed to look at every sort of social issue and ill or whatever it is through the lens of all of these different intersections, the intersections of race, of gender, of sex, of class, of whatever it is. So I would notice that even in interviews and conversations, the questions that would be posed to me would be things like, so Africa, as a black woman, what do you think of X, Y, Z, whatever the thing is? Mm. It, almost every single time, Mark, every single time. So I, I now sort of was being programmed to think about my race first. It, it feels so, my skin feels like it's crawling even as I think about it because I can, I can start to see now so clearly how things ended up the way they did, you know, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. But in the beginning, again, all of it seems so harmless in the beginning because you just think they, you know, they just want to know what your experience is like as a black woman. Mm -hmm. But what mm -hmm. it's doing, it's making me find fault. So let's say it's in the sobriety industry. So Africa, as a black woman, do you think there's much representation in recovery spaces? Then I'm like, well, I guess what I'm supposed to do now, and because you feel so grateful to even be given the opportunity to have the conversation, what I'm supposed to do now is to look at the fact that there aren't that many black people in recovery spaces, even though it could be for a ton of other reasons. For example, if you're African or an immigrant, most likely you're not going to be thinking about going to physical recovery spaces apart from church or to the mosque or wherever else. Mm -hmm. So there are many mm -hmm. reasons why it's not because the racism is so, you know, abundant in, but everything was positioned in a way where I had to look for malicious intent, racialized mm -hmm. malicious intent. So I just started to notice very slowly how that was happening, but I was also accepting it. So this is where the self accountability comes in for me. And I wrote about this in my book that if I'm to be honest with myself, I also used my racial identity to get opportunities because I saw mm -hmm that if I speak about in a certain way about my experience as a black woman, then I'm more likely to be heard. And then if I mm. speak about my experience as a black woman who uh, is left leaning, then my mm. experience is more likely to be heard. If I'm a black woman who's left leaning and an immigrant, because that's the idea of intersectionality, right? You look at all of those intersections of your identity, but I started to also treat other people in the same way that and I, I didn't even realize that this was happening until I looked back with an honest eye that mm -hmm. there was also this idea because everything is sort of like a script that that's where it becomes really culty. There's kind of like a script mm -hmm. for everything, you know, mm -hmm. um, in the same way that people would ask me questions like, so Africa is a black woman. And then mm -hmm. I would end up finding myself in conversation saying things like, so for me as a black woman, and then mm -hmm. you'll have someone else saying, 
oh, as a white woman, Africa, I know that I'm a, as, as a privileged white woman speaking to me, mm. you know, before they even say mm. anything. It's like you have to give all of these. That was where I first noticed that there was something that I was participating in that didn't feel quite right, but it was the only mm. way to connect with the people around me. And mm. then slowly it, it became a very big focus on race, probably from around 2018 up until 2020 when I started writing the open letter, where I felt the most uncomfortable with everything is when I was being told that I had to accept the idea that every white person, and there was no nuance in this, it's exactly how things were presented and written, etc. Every white person is inherently racist unless they sign up or take part in some sort of anti-racist training or practice or admit to their racism or it, it was a very bizarre thing because it reminded me of the religious upbringing that I'd had in end time message and this idea and, and again I mean it's probably in so many parts of Christianity but this idea of the original sin you have to admit that you are a sinner and only until you admit that you're a sinner and start doing the work, that language again, and you start doing the work, then you are someone that is in many ways unworthy ultimately, but you are someone that we can't trust, which was a big one. We can't trust you unless you admit your sin. So cast this to social justice spaces, and this is not all of them by any means. These are just the mm -hmm. ones that were very, very, um, potent for me at that time and there's still so many offshoots of them online but the idea that if you're a white person the original sin that you have to admit is that a part of you is a white supremacist you're just not aware of it but you can only be labeled a safe person if you admit to it and start doing the anti-racist work to be to acknowledge your biases and this is where for me i couldn't go there I, I tried for a little bit to kind of try and understand it. And a lot of it is sort of wrapped in academic jargon. So you think it kind of makes sense. But then I thought to myself, wait, so the white people that I grew up with in South Africa and Zimbabwe, and if I know someone from Norway and a white person from Kenya and a white person from Australia, so all of them are exactly the same. And they, I, I, I just had a, you know what I mean? I, I just had a lot of questions that exactly. couldn't be answered, but, but I couldn't even ask them. It's not that I asked and no one could answer. I couldn't even ask them. So that's when I started to notice the level of self-censoring in my own mind. Because yeah. again, it's not even like I had an opportunity to externalize these things. Mm. It was that I saw what happens to other people when they ask questions. You see it, mm. you see what mm. happens to people in the comment sections, but even in the groups that are supposed to be safe, you see exactly what happens to people. The labeling, depending on, on what it is you ask, in what realm it is, gender, race, whatever, you're a bigot, you're some kind mm. of transphobe, you're a white supremacist. So they're called, um, I learned that all of these are called thought terminating cliches which mm -hmm. is just a brilliant mm -hmm. term, isn't it? And I'm sure yeah. you're familiar with this, Very where familiar, someone yeah. will just yeah. throw out this term to shut down the entire conversation and nothing. Yeah. Once you're labeled, especially now more than ever, once you're labeled alt-right, you're labeled a bigot, yeah. you're, la you're labeled a transphobe, a white supremacist, there, there's no more conversation to be had. Right. No more right. conversation to be had. So for me, if we fast forward just to this letter, and again, I, I'm glad that you directed people to all of the different conversations I've had and on my platform, yeah. they're continued conversations because there's yeah. so much more to this. But I, I, I think it, it was important for me to put all of that forward to say that open letter was a moment in time, but it was such a gradual experience for me to even get to a point of understanding what was really happening. So in 2020, yeah. especially in the summer, what I think of as the summer of BLM because of George Floyd's death, very, very unfortunate death and the conversations mm -hmm. that it caused. And I think there were some very important conversations that were sparked. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. the shadowy side of it, we can't pretend that we didn't all experience it. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. the very cult-like behaviors of all of us because you're 
I, I think it really exposed so many people, myself included, this kind of, um, this, I can never say this word, but you can help me out. This author, author, to help me out, Mark. Authoritarian. You know the word. That's Authoritarian. The word. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird <laughs> word. You, you really got to see just how we all have these ideas about how we'll behave in situations. But you mm. only have to be in the situation to truly experience yourself. And mm. a lot of and a lot of us want to be led more than we realize. Mm. We want to be told exactly what to think, yeah. exactly what to do. And it can yeah. be a very uncomfortable thing to admit that when you see everyone else behaving in a certain way, even if you know that I don't agree with this, this is not the right thing to do. The crowd decides how you are going to behave. And I yes. saw I saw that in such a stark way, these demands to post the black square. If you don't post the black square, then X, Y, Z. Yeah. If you don't yeah. speak in this way, if you don't use your platform, if you don't, it, it, it was so intense. And I saw myself behave in that way for a very short period of time until I got into a place of, it's almost like I, I dissociated in a way that was really useful. I floated over myself and I watched myself behave in this way. And I don't think I've ever felt more truly disturbed in my own body. And that's when I started writing that letter, why I'm leaving the cult of wokeness, because that's exactly what it felt like. I, this idea of being woke and awake and being willing to push back on racial injustice or any kind of injustice, I am all for, this is not what it was. And we all know it's not what it was. And this language of a cult, I didn't say that loosely. That's exactly what it felt like. Watching my mum being sucked into a cult for as long as we did and knowing yeah. now what it was and seeing the patterns, man. And by this time, I was also familiar with you and everything that you had shared around Nixium and I, I've always had such an interest in cults as well, since I was very young, interestingly enough. But I, I'd never sort of realized that until much, much later, until after the open letter, that actually all of these things that I was writing down in here, this declaration that I'm not playing the game anymore. Yeah. I, even the way that I start off the open letter um, by saying that I am so willing to be canceled. I'm so willing to be exiled. If it means freeing my mind, if it means being in integrity, if it means not walking through the world looking for malicious intent, not looking at people through the lens of race and identity and thinking your word is only worthy if you occupy this specific identity, I will not do that anymore. It was yeah. causing me yeah. so much physical pain by that point. I was experiencing yeah. chronic migraines for about two years up until I wrote that oh, open letter. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So your body oh, was telling you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, Mark, it was, and I know that you understand this well, but it was such a cognitive dissonance doesn't quite cut mm -hmm. it to explain what mm -hmm. was happening. It was, everything had to change. Everything had yeah. to change and I couldn't hold yeah. my tongue anymore. So that open yeah. letter freed me in ways that, in ways that I'll never be able to truly convey with words. You know, similar mm -hmm. to the open letter that I wrote in 2017 saying, I am an addict. I am not going mm -hmm. to run away from it anymore. Um, yeah. And since then, from studying and researching self-sabotage again, it's when I realized that actually collective sabotage is what we're experiencing as a mm -hmm. collective. There's such a relational breakdown, a communication breakdown. And I, I made that mm -hmm. my my mission to truly understand what it is, but not only to talk about the why, to talk about how, if this is a communication breakdown, how do we build collective intimacy again, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's hence, where hence I'm led title, to today. Hence the title of your book, The, the Third Perspective, which I think is so yeah. powerful. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but um, I wanted to tell you that your letter, when I read your letter, I was like, damn, mm. damn. You know, it was very, very impressive to me. And it was written at a time when things were seriously, seriously prickly. Gosh. You know, and, I, and then I thought, okay, so now she's a heretic. She's a heretic mm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, not in your own mind, 
but in the mind yeah. of a bunch of people. It's funny, I shared your letter with some people on social media uh, a couple of days ago, and it was interesting, the responses. Um, one person, I'm just going to call them by their race just for the purpose of this discussion, yes. but one person who was white couldn't take it in because the in in their words they were what they were saying was i'm i'm a white piece of shit this can't be true mm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm shit and i was like wow so you've really that's your entire identity is you're white and shit okay and then somebody um uh who's african-american just said like how dare you even have this conversation how dare you basically and i was like all right you know we need to we need to have conversations there, there's a problem absolutely um, I want to read quickly an excerpt. You you know these words very well, Please. but I want to read for my audience an excerpt from your book that's so powerful. You wrote, um, I want you to imagine a world where every word, every belief, and every idea is under a microscope, watched closely and then picked apart. A world where conversations at dinner become quiet chats and it feels like you're always on edge trying not to upset anyone. Every time you post online, you worry. Will this get me lots of likes or a ton of angry comments? This is a world most of us have become intimately familiar with, a world where we're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Because of this fear, a lot of us are holding back. We're scared of being misunderstood, labeled, or left out. So we play it safe, not asking tough questions or speaking our minds. Mm. So beautiful. Thank you. So beautiful because I think what in, in your book and actually pretty much in everything that you do, you're speaking to a lot of people who are feeling this way. I, I, the news and social media represent the loudest voices and sometimes the most narcissistic voices. But there's this massive group, you know, in, in I guess I'll call it the middle, who listen to your words and go, yeah, that's how I feel. That's how I feel. So I find it so profound that you took your early experiences of childhood and then you mapped it onto what was happening societally, which, as you know, mm -hmm. is my obsession. That's why yes. I'm so excited. My obsession coming out of a cult is to map those things, not to force map them, mm. but just to see, oh, that's similar, that's similar, that's similar. And then, and then I look more deeply and I go, oh, that this entire thing is behaving like a cult. Right. And nobody can see it because they're so involved in the euphoria of being on the right side, let's say, which is very, very, uh, it's a very dangerous place to be, the euphoria of mm -hmm. being right. Um, or they're stuck in, you know, what I'm starting to think of as the goodness trap. The, these are the things I do because I'm good. Right. I'm a good person and I want to be on the right side of history. Therefore, I will do these things. And yes, there might be some unsavory things that I'm doing, but it's for the greater cause. It's for the greater good. Mm. I know you know exactly what I'm saying. I do. I do. And you know what? I, I, in my work and in everything that I talk about, and even in this book, I always want to make sure that I'm not speaking from a place of, um, sort of holier than thou and i wonder if you get that too because i think it can be so easy once you find a new way of being it can be so easy to look at your past self as if they were just so ignorant they were just so mm -hmm. susceptible to to anything that was put forward that mm -hmm. you know um almost looking at it through a lens of uh, superiority in some way yeah so i yeah. always try my best to not do that to myself first of all and to yeah. not do that to the people that i see behaving in the way that i was you know yes yes i i have um two reactions to when i see those things my first reaction mm -hmm. is i i get involved in the outrage economy yes that's my first thing you know and i and i i've been known to have a temper and so like i want to start saying things on social media and my beautiful wife says stop and breathe mm, mm -hmm. is this useful i'm like no it's not useful okay then shut up for now and think um <laughs> and i think what's more important and you you allude to it you know in your book your whole in essence your third perspective your third way um to imagine yourself in that person's shoes i think is so yes. powerful like when yes. have i been like that when have i been a devotee 
when have I dissociated and and basically said things and done things that are kind of objectively morally reprehensible? Mm, because mm-hmm. I guarantee you, I can find them in my life. And then I go, okay, yeah. so there, that's what it is. And what's the fear that I was experiencing, um, the, the, the upset to my psyche if my worldview was to be proved incorrect? And is mm. it possible that they're experiencing something like that? You know? Yes, exactly. Um, which I find, you know, in all your exercises, what I find so beautiful in the exercises in your book is you're always bringing it back to self. Yes. You know, and, and I'm sort of jumping around a bit, but it just gets me thinking. Um, I find that you do something very interesting in your book and in your life. There are people wanting to censor us, stop us, shut us down, whatever, whatever. That, that's all there. But I find that you don't use the world's, I call it prickliness, as an excuse mm. for why you shouldn't express yourself. And I was thinking to myself, and I think I've done this at various times, I'm worried about what they're going to say, but I don't think they're the issue. I think it's me internally battling mm. with my own demons, but I'm making them the excuse. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Oh. Oh, absolutely. I, I love that so much. I love that so much because I think it can easily become, it can easily become a cop out to stop Mm. you from actually looking at where, looking at your own cowardice, for example. And I had to do that with myself, right? It's, Mm -hmm. it's stupidly easy to externalize. It's the, it's actually the default to externalize. And I say that in the book that I commend anyone that's actually going to go through it because I think some people will assume that you can just sit in bed and sort of read through the per- third perspective in a passive <laughs> way. That's not what this is. <laughs> yeah. When I read that, I was like, oh, we're going to get dirty. All right. All right. <laughs> because I need you to do something that is really unnatural, which is to self scrutinize. It's not, it's not the natural thing to do. And I really acknowledge that. And I, even, even to be so reflective and to ask yourself such probing questions, you know, it's, it's not natural for us. So I I have a deep respect for anyone that is willing to do that because when we do hear words like censorship, and this is sort of how I open, we think big tech, we think pharma, Mm -hmm. we think, you know, Mm -hmm. all of these big things that when you Mm -hmm. are feeling inspired and motivated, it's like, yeah, we're going to take that. How do we, but it's so, it's so big. What about Mm -hmm. in your everyday life around the table? When someone Mm -hmm. says, Hey, did you see that thing? What do you think about that? And instinctively you're like, there's five of them. There's one of me. I know that they all think this way. So yeah. I have a decision to make in this moment in time where I can say, actually, I didn't agree with that. And then just mm. hold it and then just hold it mm. and then just hold that. Disc- That's what I care mm. about, because mm. only when you can do that is when you actually have the true grounded courage to do the bigger stuff. Because the the reason why I'm so glad that I discovered the term self-sabotage a very long time ago and started to really make that my work as in wanting to understand it is when I think of collective sabotage and cancel culture, sure, the end result is that it's collective, but it's made up of individuals who have, who have their own bullshit individuals who have an inability to communicate clearly, individuals who think that being what I call assertive plus, which means aggressive, um, individuals that think being aggressive is being assertive, what would happen if you get one of those individuals to understand their communication style, which we do in the book? Mm. What would Mm. happen if you get one of those individuals to understand their listening style? Are you an analytical listener? right? Mm. Are you someone that listens for problems instead of solutions? Are you someone that listens with with an emotional ear? So you actually miss out the factual things that are very useful. Mm. I care more about that. I care so much more about that. I care about how you are in meetings. Mm. I care Mm. about your tone and your delivery, because again, that then all makes up the collective, right? Because Mm. you can be Mm. very firm and you can be very direct. And I think you and I are good at this where we can be firm and direct and say things that are even somewhat controversial, 
But because mm. of your tone, because of your delivery, mm. because of your facial expressions, even as I talk, mm. I have a natural thing of sort of smiling as I talk. So mm -hmm. I understand mm. that the way that it lands will be differently. Mm. So if mm. you learn to kind of adapt your body, this is all about communication. So mm -hmm. I prefer, even when I work with clients privately, I know you want to do the big thing and you want to take down mm. the government and blah, blah, blah. But what mm. are you doing in your day to day, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I always like to bring it back to the self because it's so manageable and it's doable and it's probably more difficult because it means that you yeah. have to check for the habitual things where we would yeah. all rather wait for this big moment where you stand up on stage yeah. or you say those moments are so rare. Most of us are never yeah. going to experience that. But you do experience the moment where you have to say to your partner, I want to have a conversation about our sex life. I want to try yeah. something new, you know. Yeah. Or would you self-censor and just continue doing things you do? So I, 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 I love bringing it back to the self. I do. You know, also the, the, the whole thing of pursuing the big thing, in some ways I think is a distraction because I think a part of you knows you're never mm. going to do the big thing, but you can oh, be consumed gosh, with yeah. the big thing rather than dealing with the thing right in front of you, right? Um, mm -hmm. You said that we're pretty good at, at, at this thing, the communication. I think you're better. And, and, and here's something that I noticed about myself in the circles. Like, let's say I go to, go to, you know, LA or, you know, the big cities, there is a very different mindset than if I'm out in the middle of nowhere, you know, with farmers, very different mindset. Mm -hmm. And I find myself broaching topics and I will, I have a bunch of disclaimers mm. before I talk about the thing. And I've been noticing because what's going on for me is I, you know, I've been, I've been, uh, I've taken a lot of hits over the last few years yeah. and I'm, t I'm just tired of just, you know, just getting accused mm -hmm. of shit I didn't do or just being misunderstood or whatever. Um, and a part of me is just like, I just don't want to have to deal with like, you know, mm. them misunderstanding me. So I want to do everything I can to make sure that I control the situation so that they know exactly what I mean, delusionally believing that if I do, you know, 10 minutes of disclaimers, somehow it's going to help, which it won't. So I noticed this thing rather yeah. than just saying, well, this is what I think. Certainly open to that I'm wrong, but this is what I think. Yeah. You know, I, I noticed that inside myself. I noticed myself uh, protecting myself. And I noticed in listening to you, you don't do that. Mm. You don't do no. that. That's no. amazing. That's incredible it's, to me. Um, it's tempting even sometimes mm. to do that. You know where you know where I do that a little mm. bit, Mark? And I speak about this, that in my romantic relationships, I experience self-censorship differently than I do anywhere else. I am mm. so direct with my audience, with my clients, with whoever else in a business meeting, whatever it is. But mm. something happens in my romantic relationships where there can be a bit of, um, and again, I, I only have to look at how my first model of relationship, my parents, and what would happen when my mom would be completely honest, you know, or mm. even try mm. to be, um, mm. that there's something there where I feel an, a, a sort of inclination to wrap up what I'm saying in disclaimers or an apologetic mm. demeanor, but I just, I just don't do it. I don't do it anymore at all, but it's where I can feel a little bit of like wanting to um, sort of cushion what I'm trying to say. Yes. So it's interesting yes. how in one area you can be a yes. very assertive communicator yes. and then in another area you can be more passive. So that's yes. the kind of thing that I love for people to notice as well, to realize that Communication is truly an art form and it's so fluid, but look at where you're more passive, look at where you're able to be assertive and what, why are you able to be more assertive there? What are, what are the conditions that allow mm. for you to be assertive, even your internal mm. conditions, you know? So I find that yes. so interesting, but the disclaimer thing, I speak about it so much and the yeah. apologetic demeanor, because sometimes even yes. if you're not disclaiming with words, you're disclaiming with your body. And it's, it's so yes. interesting. Yeah. Yes. When actually even just a little posture change or right. even a little bit more eye contact. Yeah. It, it's, it says so much, you know, you're Gosh. so right. You're so right that, you know, there's something else that you talk about. Um, I made a note, you know, when you talk about self-censorship, 
Mm. Um, you know, you talk about um, you're holding your thoughts back. You know, your feelings, your knowledge, out of, you know, out of fear, mm. doubt, or the desire to fit in. Um, and then you said something. You said, you know, think of it as gagging yourself before anyone else has a chance to mm. gag you. And I was like, oh my god, that's the inner child policing you. Yes. You know, that's the. And then and then you speak about the inner mob. And I, I found that so interesting. Can you speak a bit about the inner mob? I, this this mm. to me is such a f fascinating idea. Absolutely. I think of it as, and I, I came up with this um, idea before I was writing the open letter. It's in my, in my journals. I was just sort of writing and writing like, writing and saying rather that at times it's starting to feel like I have a mob in my mind, you know? that I'm parts of me are more worried about the external mob, the mob in the comment mm. sections, being mobbed online, being told that I'm wrong, whatever. But I feel like what's more dangerous is this mob in my mind, this team of people. And it looks different at different times. I use the, the sort of uh, analogy in the book of like a, the scene in The Simpsons. If anyone knows the, mm. <laughs> of the villagers in The Simpsons with their, oh, with their yes. sort of torches, yes. right? And but sometimes it takes a different turn. And for me at that specific moment in time, the mob in my mind looked sort of like a team, like a team in a corporate office of just like taking all of these files and sort of shredding all of these files and hiding all of these files from me. Anytime that I was curious about anything, it's like this team, this mob would go into an absolute frenzy trying to hide things from me to keep them away so that I don't I don't look because I'm not supposed to find out I'm not supposed to ask questions so before anyone outside me even does that shreds the files and says Africa you can't speak about this I already have a very well-trained team in my mind that is doing the job immediately. The moment a question comes in, the moment a thought comes in, the moment I notice a contradiction, the moment uh, the goalpost moves again, and I, I want to say something about it, that the team just comes right on in and they do their mm. job and they do it very, very well. But what would it look like if I actually befriend that team? I'm not trying to get rid of them. I need to become friends with them so that they know, so they, they start handing me the files instead. So that when I have the question, they come in and they start handing me the files instead saying, hey, Africa, have you looked in here? There's this as well, you know? So the idea that I have is that the mob in your mind is gonna look so different for all of us. But once you notice it and start to see it and name it, have fun with it, get super creative with it, realize that the objective is to befriend them so they start working for you not against you so I, I find that to be such a such a delicious concept it's one of my favorite things it is i love it because you're, you're loving them you're loving them and letting them have their place and they yes. relinquish some of their grip and their fear by doing mm. that yeah right because they're not going anywhere no that's also no. the thing to know they're not yeah <laughs> No, they you will can't just exterminate to them. Morph. Uh -uh. Yeah. Uh -uh. No, you can't exterminate. You know. I on the on the inner mob there's a tendency and I find myself doing this that I I want to focus on the on the mob outside. Mm -hmm. Like the way the world is suppressing me, the way the, the the world's doing this, the world's doing that, the mob's doing this, the mob's doing that. But I, what I love yeah. about your book is you're pointing to the inner mob. Mm. As you know, because there's this idea like I, I have to just change the world somehow to yeah. match, you know, my own ideology. And you're saying, yeah, no, that's not that's not going to work. You, you don't say this explicitly, mm. but you mm -hmm. point people to like internally do the work so that you are free with respect to your self-censorship mechanisms. Yes. Yes. And I find that so powerful and so refreshing. The, the, the onus being back in yourself and you speak about responsibility. I know some people don't like responsibility, <laughs> but I think it's powerful, right? Me too. I really do. And I, I thank you so much for um, just putting all of this forward, because at this point in time, it's so it's so good to just hear how people have experienced some aspects of of this book and some of the concepts, because what I really wanted to do is to take things that are they are huge and they are complex, but I wanted to put them forward in a way that is so accessible 
in a way that isn't sort of just shrouded in academic jargon that the average person would never be able to understand or know what, okay, what do I do with this off the page, you know? So focusing on the inner mob is very important, but something that I also think is equally important, which we then do in the next chapter, we need to absolutely talk about the mob outside because Mm -hmm. once you have a better understanding of what's happening within you internally, then we need to understand the landscape that we're all working with. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because then, you know, I always like to to do this thing where I um, invite people to think about what is your public hill versus your private hill? Because mm. when what we like to do, especially online, when we feel passionate about something and we're on these platforms that incentivize outrage, they incentivize mm. all of these emotions that are sort of in the shadow a lot of the time, whether mm. it's the anger, whether it's the disgust um, or feeling disturbed by something or just something that has emotional charge, rarely positive emotional charge. We want to react. We want to say something and do something. So we become part of the mob or we're fighting some kind of mob Mm. but you don't have to try and climb every single hill that you're presenting you just don't have to do that so part of it is also identifying wait what is my private hill and what is my public hill so i know that for me for example there are many conversations that i am still having to this day around our government's response to the pandemic and the sort Mm. of push mandating of vaccinations etc speaking to people from just all all parts of the spectrum of pro or anti or the in between or i don't give a shit or whatever those are continued Mm. conversations that i have with people in my life i have a lot of people in my family who are medical professionals who were for or against um and i have very incredible conversations with them i'm also very very connected with the lgbtq community there are so many communities that i support and there Mm -hmm. are so many concerns that i have around different things Mm -hmm. but all of those things that i've mentioned they are not my public hill you are Mm -hmm. not going to find me on social media rattling off blah blah blah. it's just it's just not my hill but you Mm -hmm. know what my fucking hill is freedom of speech I will speak about that until the cows come home. I will talk about the things that are working, the things that are not working. I will share things from people that you maybe don't want to hear from and people that you do want to hear from. I know what my hills are. I know what conversations I'm willing to have publicly and privately. I know that when people are messaging me right now saying, hey, Africa, why aren't you speaking up about the Middle East on on either side, by the way? That is not my public hill. I know what I'm doing offline. I'm not going to prove my goodness online to a mob or to nameless, faceless people that if I was to walk past you on the street, I would have no idea who you are. We're strangers Mm. to each other. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding the external mob in whatever form Mm -hmm. it takes is very important, but you have to understand yourself internally first, you know, so that you even know how to deal with it. Is it worth it? Is it not? Am I willing to hold this discomfort? Can I allow for my own inner team to support me and to be like, actually, Africa, you don't need to do that there. You can do that over there, you know? So I I like to to kind of um, address the two, but I put much more emphasis on the inner because that's where your resilience is. That's where your mental fortitude is. That's where all of these characteristics and traits and qualities that are truly supportive, especially in moments of external pressure, they're much more important, much more important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's something that I love. Well, there's many things I love about your book, but one of the things Mm. you talk about is getting very clear on your own values and that that's sort of paramount in navigating expression in this framework of censorship that we live Mm. in. You know, and I love that you keep pointing back to what are your values? Like, what do you stand for? Like, what's the hill you're willing to die on? Like for me, for instance, you know, this whole idea of seeing the pattern of coercion to me is uh, that's, I want to talk about all the time because I see it everywhere. You know, Um, you know know what I love? I'll just jump in, Mark, and say what I love so much about what you just said, especially the part about seeing it everywhere. I love that, especially because to me, it's tied to a very specific intention and a specific why. Mm -hmm. 
because I see it everywhere. So therefore, I do need to talk about it. I do need to talk about how you might experience it in interpersonal relationships where you don't even see that it might be happening, you know? Mm. So I, I, the, re, the way that I map out kind of what is my public hill, for example, is if I know that it's just not about me. It's just mm. not about me sort of saying, this is my opinion, this is what I think. I want to make sure that I'm adding something that is of value. So for me, when it comes to the conversation of freedom and expression and speech and censorship, etc., it goes so beyond me that I feel compelled to speak about it because yeah. I, I'm not the only one that is suffering from it. I'm not the only one that is losing intimacy from it or losing connection. So I think you've just said something important there that can help someone listening, a way that you can kind of start to think about what your public hill is, try and have it be tied to an intention and a motivation that is not selfish, you know, that is yeah. not just, this is yeah. my opinion, this is what I think, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I mm -hmm. like that, I like that. Okay, so just explain to everybody what happened and why Africa has suddenly moved somewhere else is because um, the computer died and we're now restarting, so that's what's going on. I noticed that in myself and also in people, people I spoke to, they would be angry at themselves for not speaking up. Mm. And then I read something in your book that really uh, profoundly moved me, which is you said that there's a biological reward for conformity. Hmm. And I was like, holy shit, I did not know that. Can you speak a bit about that? Yes, of course. Um, this is in a section, a very early on section of the book where I talk about the biology of conformity in that, and I think this is something that I like to remind myself to so that it can, so that I can remember that in moments where I feel the pull to conform or to agree very specifically, to agree with things that I don't actually agree with, to behave in a way that I know is not right, but everyone else is doing it. So that mob mentality, that crowd mentality, that tribe mentality, is to remember that we are such tribal creatures. We don't want to be left out because there was a point in time when we look back to our ancestors, but we still have that wiring, right? Where if you are cast out of the group, it does mean danger. It means that you're not fed. It means that you don't have any connection. It means that you will never be partnered, meaning that you will never have children, that you will never be part of the tribe, you know? So there are ways of being that you have to just go along with in order to fit in. So, and I, I go much deeper into it, but I think what what is really just important for me to put forward there is that when you do find yourself conforming, when you do find yourself behaving in ways that are not entirely true to you, but everyone else is doing it, so surely I should mm. be doing the same thing, mm. compassion is needed. And just an understanding of the biology of being human, it is so important to understand that because then it means that we don't make everything a moral failure, right? It's that mm. thing that um, you were saying right at the beginning, which I so resonate with, the idea that I should know better than this, mm. but I've researched this, you know, I've studied, I've read so many books, I've listened to so many podcasts, I should know this. Mm. And we completely dismiss that we're just animals, we're primal creatures, you know, and we will, yeah. we will go so far and you only have to look at so many incidents in history, even things that are happening in real time, that will go so far in order to belong and to be accepted. Um, yeah. So for me, that's something that I feel kind of grounds me when I remember things in that very simple biological way, you know. It's beautiful. It really yeah. helped me. I was like, right, I keep forgetting. Like our tendency is to to do that. Yeah. Our tendency is towards harmony. Yes. At a time biologically when we weren't really thinking about developing a sense of self and, you know, none of that mattered. It was just it was just survive. Absolutely. Um in, in the jungle still... of the bush experience that yourself mark where you still feel the need to belong which again we all have mm. but very specifically do you still i feel myself in a tug of war sometimes between like i'll i'll be sitting somewhere somebody says something and i'm a part of me is like going yeah i don't buy this mm. now what should i say you know and i think carefully about because there's the whole thing about you know discretion is a better part of valor like like i don't have to to have a fight with somebody no. um i like to try to have conversations where we can try and pull back 
and and look at the patterns of something. But mm. when I sometimes when I see somebody deeply entrenched, you know, I did a podcast about it where I talk about trench warfare. Like when you're in the trench, you can't see what the hell's going on. You can be played against the other side very easily. Mm. And sometimes I feel this tug of war of like, do I just say nothing, which will make everything go very smoothly, but I'll part of me feels like I'll die inside. Hmm. I'm certainly not going to like attack the person for their opinion because yeah. uh, that that's pointless. But what can I say? So in that moment, I feel this like this dinner could just easily wrap up very nicely. Hmm. But here I go. You know? <laughs> you know what I mean, don't you? Of course I do. Do you think sometimes you need that though? <laughs> that just to let it, that the dinner just go. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I, I think you do. You can't fight about everything, right? No. You can't fight about absolutely everything. And there's live and let live. And there's also people are expressing their truth. And it, it is their truth. Yeah. Whether you know, we even like if it it's not. a brainwashed idea that and you all the talking points are the talking points from the news yesterday, mm -hmm. it is their current, you know, version of reality. And I think, you know, I've struggled so hard because I got to, you know, I had this thing, I have to save the world, save this, save that, save. Uh, no. no, no, I don't have to do any of that. No. By the way, I think your your book has the capacity to save the world. I, um, oh, I wow. told some of my Patreon members, your book is, is, um. Wait, okay. I have, I have, um, I th mm. thought I'd have one more question, but I have two more questions. <laughs> I do want to ask you about uh, Mbuya Neanda. Is it Neanda? Yes, Mbuya Neanda. Neanda, yeah. So, but, Nehanda, but before that, yes. um, just tell us this wonderful idea of the maverick mindset. Yes. Just tell us what the maverick mindset is. Oh, I love that. So the, the maverick is not actually just the Tom Cruise movie. It, it means a very specific thing, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> Maverick is an independent thinker and it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful word. And even when you say it to me, it kind of, I feel like a strength in my body, even as I say it. A Maverick is an independent thinker. It's someone that is willing to go against the grain even when, and I like to add that especially, especially when, it's the unpopular thing to do, but they know that they are rooted in integrity. They are rooted in truth. It's someone who's willing to be creative and strategic, even in moments of adversity. It's someone who, even though they lead with assertiveness, they're so open and willing to have their mind changed. They're not just an independent thinker who's wrong and strong. It's someone that is willing to have their worldview refined, but to also stand in something strong. So for yes. me, why I use, and I give very specific tools, it's not just an idea that I'm putting forward as a nice to have. I think it is so urgent and I put it forward in a very solutions focused, a very practical way in how to actually cultivate that mindset. And it's going to look so different for all of us, but now more than ever, like we were talking about before with the the disclaimers, for, for example, or just an apologetic demeanor in conversations. And even when we're speaking to people we've known for such a long time, there's this sort of just constant walking on eggshells in our own bodies, in our own voices. And I, I really think we need to lead with courage and embodying mm -hmm. that maverick mindset can allow you to do that. Even if it's just one of those things being like, okay, I'm going to work on being creative, even in moments of adversity, when I feel like I don't have any more options. That's why it's it's the framework of the third perspective, because there's there are always options that you can't see. There's always yeah. a different alternative, a different approach that is always available. If you're willing to sort of stand in that discomfort, stand in that confusion, and then decide that you're going to seek it, you know? So to me, mm. that is a maverick, someone that is, really willing to stand in their integrity and their conviction while remaining open to the world. Um, so that's how I would describe it. I love that. I, mm. I love that. Um, I want to end with, I read toward the end of your book, um, somebody you admire, Mbuya Nahanda. And yeah. I'd love you just to share who she was and why she inspires mm. you. I, You know, when I came to... I didn't even know that that was going to be a part of the book. I came to writing the closing chapter, um, 
but then decided that I was going to add a final note because as I was collecting stories from family members, I went to Zimbabwe for the first time in 20 years in wow. last year. Yeah, for the wow. first time in 20 years. Since leaving, I hadn't gone back. And when I was there, I was able to collect stories from, my goodness, from cousins that I'd left when they were six, when they were five, when I was nine and some were eight, some were seven. And now they're, they're grown ups with their families, with their stories, with their pains. You know, I was able to sit with my aunts and my uncles and recounted so many stories around the fire, stories about my father, stories about my mother, stories about my upbringing, but mainly stories about our ancestors and how Zimbabwe came to be, what life was like in Rhodesia, what life was like way before that, what what life was like um, from the stories that they have when, you know, our country was first colonized. And Mbuya Nehanda has always been a very significant figure in Zimbabwe. She was a spiritual medium, but she was also a freedom fighter. And her and her husband, Kaguvi, they fought British colonialists in, I mean, centuries and centuries ago. And when I think back to what life could have even been like at that time, the very real dangers that were around yes. and yet this woman just oh my goodness at a time when women didn't do such things women were not fighters at that time you know women were not warriors or seen or encouraged to be warriors but she had a uh, she had a ferocity that just my my body you know feels so activated even as i think about it and because of her fighting, even just the stories, I mean, th they were killed. Of course they were killed. Mm -hmm, but they mm -hmm. stood their ground in a way that most of us will never, ever have to. So for me, as a Zimbabwean woman from the Shona tribe, the life that I get to live now in the Western world, again, the odds of my mother and my family and our lineage from everything that we've experienced for me to sit here in the Western world with all of the luxuries that I have and not even luxuries in the way that other people might think of, but like I was saying, the luxury of being able to have freedom of movement, the luxury of having a passport that allows me to go from country to country, the luxury that allows me to lose a job today, walk into a place called a job center and they can help me find a job by next week. That is Oh my goodness. So when I think of someone like Mbuya Nehanda, which is an extreme example in a lot of ways, because most of us will never have to fight for our country in that way, or at least not yet for most of us, you know, it makes me realize that what I have to do in this lifetime, the way that I have to speak up, the way that I have to stand up for what is true, the way that I have to discard any any grain of victimhood put forward to me or that is within me is nothing in comparison to what my ancestors have been through. And I write it in the book that anytime that I feel greatly afraid, which I never really feel so much anymore, but I make room for the fact that I will feel a sense of deep fear one day. I always imagine, and I really do, I just visualize her hand on my, on my shoulder, probably saying mwana wangu. And I know exactly what I have to do. And I imagine my mother doing the exact same thing. Her as a woman in her mid thirties, starting from nothing, coming to a new country, having to put her children in school, having to live kind of in shame and embarrassment, living in student halls, a tiny little room with her four kids in there. But it felt like a palace to us. It was incredible. We never knew, we never knew that we were poor, had nothing. So that story of Mbuya Nehanda not only speaks to her, the individual woman, but it speaks to every single woman in my entire life, the matriarchs in my family, the patriarchs in my family, where I'm from, my tribe. And, you know, tribalism has all of its faults, but to know that you are from a lineage of people that fought for something is such a beautiful thing. So that's why I had to close the book with that story and tying it back to my why. 
Um, but yeah, it was so profound. I, it was never part of the plan. I didn't know that I was going to write it. It just fell out of my fingertips when I got to that point of closure. Mm. That felt like the true point of closure, you know, but a beginning right. in a lot of ways too. I feel when I read the book, I feel that maybe her spirit speaks through you mm. because a lot of the things you admire about her, I think you are. So there's that. I feel so privileged that you spent this time with me. So honored. Well, thank you. I, oh, yeah, the, this conversation happened at exactly at exactly the right time yeah. for a multitude of reasons. And I really appreciate that you're similar to me in that you you trust that everything will happen when it needs to. There's no, there's no, nothing is ever forced. Everything is exactly as it is, when it is. And I also just value that outside of having respect for you intellectually and through um, our shared experiences in a lot of ways, just having you as a friend, the times that we've sat together and just laughed. And mm -hmm. it's amazing because when we have sat together, we've rarely spoken so much about the things that were kind of known objectively for, if that makes sense. Yeah. We just sit together yeah. and get to know each other as Mark yeah. and Africa and Bonnie. And yeah. it, it's yeah. it's that simple. And I, I love that. I cherish that. Mm -hmm. I do. Me too. Me too. I, mm -hmm. I have this, and I also have this feeling, I don't know what it is, but I'm so excited to meet somebody from Africa anytime I bump into them. Oh, yeah. I get so excited yes. and it's, yes. it's, it goes, it's way beyond color. It's just like uh -huh. of course. from the same mother continent, you know, there's something about that. That's so beautiful. Home. So yeah. I just it's love that sense that. of home. Yeah. Yes. It's that sense of home. I miss the bush. I miss the, I miss <gasps> the land, you know, I don't miss the politics, you know what? but I miss the we land. Need, we need to take a trip. We might have to take a so. trip to the motherland. I yeah. think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. thank you again. And for my audience, I always say at the end of every episode, please stay curious.